Platinum members and those around the room here, we certainly appreciate your support and your being with us. So I urge everybody uh, to go around and introduce yourself and meet these folks who provide some wonderful services. So um, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, May, Mike Angus. Vice President of Brown and Brown Insurance. Some of you may not know Brown and Brown is the fifth largest independent insurance broker in the country, uh, providing risk management solutions to their clients. So, with this said, please welcome Mike Hinger, and uh, we appreciate his moderating. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't know why they chose me. My uh, technology limits about right here. So uh, my job today is going to be try and keep the process moving, um, get to some questions, and then obviously get the information from the panelists. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce who we have today. Uh, first off, we have Chris Norman Dell. Is that correct? Norman Dell. Well, Norman Dell with First Service Residential. Uh, we have Chris Sherrick with Sherrick Solutions. You just raise your hand so we know which one you are. Uh, we have Dee Smith from Nature Zone. I didn't see Dee. Where is Dee? She's not here yet. She is not here. She's running late. And Dee is a fill-in today. Uh, unfortunately, we had someone uh, cancel last minute, new plumbing technologies. Um, he had a, uh, a family emergency, so he couldn't be with us today, so we're sorry about that. But Dee, hopefully, will be uh, here shortly. Um, we also have Darren Caldwell to my left here with Rightway Emergency Services. The bald guy, Mr. Clean, and uh, Lester Santos from Cadence Bank. Okay. Um, today, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to get to everyone's questions, but obviously we want to get the data from the panelists. So what we're going to do is we're going to let each panelist speak for a little bit, talk about uh, uh, the technologies in their business, and then we'll answer a couple questions throughout, and then we'll move on to the next presenter. Um, while there are many ways new technologies can be helpful to improve the operations in condominiums, there's also uh, the pros and cons to those. So we're going to find out today a little bit about how to move and the cost to move your association into the 21st century. So this is going to be a learning experience for me as well. Looking forward to it. Um, so let's start the conversation off and let's talk, uh, we'll introduce Chris from First Service Residential, and Chris, if you wouldn't mind, is your mic working? Um, I can I can take a look. Are we broadcasting to anybody else? So we are on Zoom as well, I believe, right? Are we on Zoom, Chris? No. no. No, we are not on Zoom. Okay. I almost thought we were on Zoom until about 2 o'clock today. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> if, if I speak up, can everyone in the room hear me, or should I use the microphone? Can everybody? Mic oh, microphone. Okay. Yep. Hello? Just straight up. Just straight up. Hello? Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so thank you for the introduction, Mike. My name is Chris Normando. I'm the director of First Service Energy uh, and value engineering for First Service Residential. In my role, I help the properties that we manage uh, save energy and save water. Uh, at the end of the day, save money and do so while maintaining and, and improving the lifestyles and the property values. Uh, that you've come to enjoy. Um, uh, a nice part of the, about that as well is that it's not opposed to going green or being more sustainable. Um, they go hand in hand. It's not either or. And that's important, especially today, when the prices for everything are going up so much, right? With the uh, uh, inflation affecting everything from supplies to our daily products, finding ways to save is important for everyone, uh, especially for large condo associations, which are effectively small businesses, right? So we want to find opportunities to save wherever we can. You know, that being said, um, more than ever, people are looking to go green, they're looking to become more sustainable, and we can do both at the same time. Um, when we're looking at going green, when we're looking at becoming more sustainable, um, there's a lot of ways to do it. We can find ways to save. We can also switch, right? So we, uh, a gentleman up here is gonna talk to you about electric vehicles. 
we can apply that to other things in our association. So when we're looking at savings, we're looking at saving energy, we're looking at saving water, uh, but we're also looking at, uh, at uh, you can hold, hold on and go back a second there, Mike. Um, we're looking at saving energy, we're looking at saving water, but we can also look at going from electricity to, or excuse me, from natural gas or from fuel sources to electricity, right? Because when we're looking at uh, how electricity is made in the state of Florida, FPL, who serves Sarasota, um, they get almost a quarter of their energy from nuclear or solar power, uh, and the rest is natural gas. So if you have a natural gas heater, if we can take that from 100% natural gas to electric, well, we are decarbonizing that, right? So that's a good thing. That's a, that's a plus. The flip side of that coin is those heating sources that use electricity generally are going to cost a lot less to heat water or to heat spaces than, than, the, uh, than the fuel sources do. Um, so what does this mean? How can we go green? Uh, I like to look at it and if you're thinking about going on a diet, right, we're not going to all of a sudden just start working out or, or, or start changing what we eat. We're going to look, we're going to step on the scale. We're going to try out our pants. First, we want to measure. We want to take a look at how our electric bills, what are our water bills, how much are we consuming. Um, because when we look at how much are we consuming, we're not just looking at how much we're getting, we're paying. Every year, uh, especially FPL this last year, prices are going up. FPL has uh, increased this year anywhere up to 25% in some associations. So even if you're using the same amount as you were a year ago, your bills went way up for energy. So we really want to look at how much are we consuming, benchmark that against other associations. Your neighbors down the street, how much are they consuming compared to, to yourselves? Uh, that is going to be important because, well, how do I know if building XYZ is using too much energy? We've got to compare it to other places. Uh, some of you may or be familiar with New York City, DC, Chicago. A lot of these cities have ordinances where you're comparing different associations to each other, uh, or different buildings to each other. You get a building health score, building energy star rating score. It's kind of like when you go into a restaurant, it's got an A, B, or C on the window next to it, depending on where you are. Um, that's the same idea. That is coming to Florida. It's in Orlando already. It's going to be in Miami soon. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next five years it continues to spread. Uh, also, a lot of uh, management companies have a benchmarking uh, guide that uh, can help you compare how much are we consuming versus other properties. Not just in building to building, but age of building, square footage of building, year, uh, price, of, price per square foot. So really comparing each other, getting that good benchmark. After that, we want to make sure that we're spending money the right way. So work, work with a professional. Uh, FPL does have some resources where you can work with them. Uh, there's a lot of energy engineers out there. Uh, if you happen to be uh, working with us, I'm happy to work with you as well, specifically. Uh, then make a plan, execute it, and save it. Because at the end of the day, these are going to be business decisions for your business. Make a plan, well, first we want to do this. Next year, we want to do this and this. The following year, we're going to do these things. That's all great, but what does it mean, right? So I haven't actually told you anything other than give you a general gist of where we want to go. Uh, when we're talking about where to find savings in condos in the state of Florida, nothing's magic. I don't pick these out of a hat. Um, everyone in the room could guess where we're going to look. It's Florida. We're talking air conditioning. We're talking lighting. We're talking pumps and motors. Um, when we're talking pumps and motors, we're talking about pieces of the air conditioning equipment. Uh, and then fuel, I mentioned, can it be electrified, right? Your pool heaters, can we turn those to heat pumps? Um, that would be an, a savings, an order of magnitude cheaper to heat a pool with a heat pump than it is uh, with a natural gas heater. Uh, and then from there, water. You've got a cooling tower on the top of your roof, maybe. Pool, irrigation. All of those can be controlled uh, to help find savings. But really, at the end of the day, the best place to save water is going to be in the unit. And I'm not talking take two-minute showers. I'm not going to tell you to do that. 
I'm, I'm probably the biggest tree hugger in the room, but I do it like wearing a business suit too, and I like taking a shower as well. So uh, we can find ways to save while consuming more effectively. So I'm not saying to change your lifestyle, but I'm saying to find ways to produce leaks. Um, a more efficient water uh, shower head if you choose to go that route as an association. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other maintenance stuff. Um, there's one piece I have not talked about. Anyone, the state of Florida is known for the sunshine. There we go. Um, I haven't talked about that on purpose. I took solar engineering classes um, 20 years ago. 15 years ago in Buffalo, New York, I installed solar panels on streetlights, uh, as well as upstate New York and, and throughout the Northeast. Uh, I'm going to burst your bubble. You're welcome to go for it. I, out of the 2,000 properties that we manage in the state of Florida, have seen zero install solar panels. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and it comes down to money. Uh, you can. It's going to have about a 10 year payback, maybe more, depending on how you go about doing it. If you put solar panels on the top of the roof of a giant skyscraper on top of a 20 story building, it's going to cost even more than that. Um, and there's a few, a few reasons for that. Uh, even though your FPL bill went up 25%, it's still way cheaper than everywhere else in the country. Uh, it's about half the price or less than other areas. So New York City pays almost three times the amount that we do. Upstate New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey pays about double the, what we pay in, in electricity. So if you take in the cost, the energy created by the sun down here would be worth less than other places. Uh, number two would be rebates, incentives. Um, rebates, incentives are not existent. They don't happen in Florida. FPL is not going to give you money to put solar panels on your roof. It's just not. Um, those in other states can be 20%, 25%, 30% of the price of the panels. Uh, and then the third piece is the uh, federal tax credit. I have an income. I pay state and, or excuse me, I pay federal income tax. Associations don't. You don't have a tax appetite. So uh, that is another 20 to 30 percent off the price that you're not getting. Uh, all of that adds up to be more than a 10 year payback. So at a condo that's a decent size, to get any actual impact on your electrical bill, you're talking half a million dollars more uh, of an investment, and it really is not going to pay back for itself. So all that. Uh, being said, I don't know how long that took. I'm thinking about 10 minutes. So we 12 have, minutes. 12 minutes, all right. Uh, sorry, Darren messed up the slides a little bit for you too. That's all right. So maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll open up, see if there's uh, a couple questions, and then we'll move on to the next presenter. But before we do that, I just want to welcome you saw Dee Smith came in. She was late. She was caught in traffic. And if you didn't know, when we started, everyone was showing us their talents. So if you want to get up and show us your talent real quick before we start. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm just, just, thanks for coming. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'll take a couple and then we can do more at the end. Yes, sir. I'll come to you. Quickly. All right. So we're in the middle of uh, doing uh, diesel replacement, or we're looking at it, the diesel replacements, and we were talking about the fact that possibly getting batteries or using batteries in lieu of the diesel um, to run the systems, right? So. How have you seen that? Like, what is the real cost transfer? We're, we're probably looking at upwards around $130,000 investment in the new diesel system plus uh, the electrical, you know, upgrades that need to go with that. Uh, so, do you see any advantage in doing that, or is that something that probably doesn't or may not have an electrical advantage? Cost. Uh, great question. So, I am all for decarbonizing uh, when we can. Uh, believe me. Um, so I don't know is the exact answer to your question. Um, I have not seen it done, uh, and there's a few reasons for that, right? So uh, electrical generators, emergency generators, are not made for short little blips when you don't have electricity. They're made for longer periods of time when you don't have electricity for 
an hour, a day, a week. Um, I've seen associations on emergency generators for, for multiple months because uh, whatever, something happened in their bus bar or, or, or whatever. Um, the answer to your question uh, in general is it's probably not going to work. Um, that being said, depending on how much of your generator you're replacing, you don't, uh, there's a concept called uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, if you're replacing the whole shebang, you can go to either a biofuel or a natural gas fired generator, which works a little bit differently than diesel, but our overall is going to have a, a smaller carbon footprint than a diesel generator. Does that answer your question? No, okay. I, know, I know it doesn't, but it, we're probably talking in the millions of dollars of, of batteries. Okay, got a question over here. Uh, it's not even a question. Uh, we looked into battery replacement of a generator, and we were told in the city of Sarasota it's not allowed. Ah. That answers that. You know, I find it interesting, too. Uh, I was just thinking, in my neighborhood, there's a gentleman that put uh, the roof on. It's all sold. And I've been doing condos 27 years, and I've yet to see anybody with solar. But they're pushing it, and you see those commercials, you know, come out, and I see the Tesla line of some solar. You know, hey, you don't get up, it's free, or $2,500 credit. So that is kind of interesting that no condos have, have taken that on, and there must be a good reason, as you mentioned. Okay, um, any other quick questions? If not, we will move on. Thank you very much, for your, and we'll get back to him later, for sure. Um, Next we have Chris with Sherrick Solutions and uh, Chris has an interesting presentation as we were talking and kind of prepping for this, I was learning a little bit. Um, he has to deal with the electric charging systems within the community. So Chris, off to you. Thank you, appreciate it Mike. Uh, again, my name is Chris Sherrick. I'm an environmental engineer. Uh, it's my, my day job. Uh, but I've been, I remember actually 11 years ago, I was over here at the Palm Avenue Garage with the mayor and Stephen King when we were dedicating the brand new charging stations that were here. So I've been driving electric for 11 years, uh, gone all the way to Colorado and back. Uh, so I've seen some of the infrastructure that's out there. I've seen some of the, the pitfalls, some of the issues, um, which has led me kind of to being one of the uh, kind of the local guy to go to. Patrick Gannon, thank you for inviting me here to, to, to speak a little bit. Um, the, the adoption of electric vehicles is an exponential growth. It's not a linear trend like the hybrid vehicles that we saw in the early 2000s. So we really need to, to start getting on board as it's starting to double almost every year. So certainly one of the challenges is, is the condominiums. Let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure. I know these are kind of hard to see, so I'll just kind of go through them. But there's three different levels of charging. Uh, level one charging, is really an outlet, okay? It's a 110, way too slow. Uh, that, that will work if you're staying somewhere for a long time or if it's a last resort, it's way too slow. Level three, I'm gonna jump to that, is, is really for highway transportation. Uh, it's called DC fast charging. It's the, the very, very high uh, charging rates, 300 miles an hour level um, of charging. But level two is kind of in between. And level two is a dryer outlet. So it's, 20, it's a 240 volt uh, type 40, 50 amp circuit. And, and that's the right space. That's what we need. Uh, almost every vehicle can be charged overnight on, on this level two. So let me click, I think I got a couple different. This is just some of the pictures of some of the infrastructure. Um, that is actually an app that shows where the uh, charging stations are uh, across Florida. Um, and you can click on each one, back up real quick. You can click on each one, and that one's the St. Armand's parking garage. Thank you, Mark. Um, and, and so you can actually find uh, information real time whether or not they're being used or not. So some of these are what's called networked charging infrastructure, and some are non-networked. Obviously, the ones that are non-networked, we don't get that real time communication, but they're much, much cheaper on the capital side. So uh, downtown condominium association, downtown Sarasota condominium association did a, a survey. Uh, just a couple months ago, I think it was it was developed. Patrick, again, thank you for some of this information. Um, I'm just going to point out a couple of these, uh, couple of the information here. Uh, this question is: In which location are your charging stations? So, how many condominiums out there have charging stations? 
How many condominiums out there think they're going to need charging stations someday? Okay, if you're not raising your hand, then we've got to back up to the other ground. <laughs> um, there are different ways to do this. Obviously, you know, one way to do it is within the common areas. Uh, if you have extra parking, um, those are typically the way that, that things are done where you put the charging infrastructure at the common area and there's a credit card swipe and the, the EV owner driver can pay for the electricity and they can pay for all of that. Those are rather expensive because they're networked, because they have to have the modem in them to, to go get the information, billing information and all that fun stuff. So those are, those are relatively expensive upfront capital, but you're making sure that you're getting all the electricity paid for and those are installed in common areas. Um, the opposite of that, right, is at a, a person's, what do you guys call it, individual dedicated parking space uh, within the condominium. And those uh, don't necessarily need to have the billing capability with a modem. Uh, they could, uh, but we'll see that the state statute has recently changed, and because of that, 2018, that's not that recent, but uh, because of that, an EV owner cannot be denied a charging station. That's, that's essentially it. They have to pay for a lot of the amenities and the parts and pieces that go with that charging station, including some unique things like uh, possibly in, in increased insurance or um, those kinds of things, and some of the installation. Not all of the installation. Uh, if the condominium is completely maxed out with the electricity coming to it right now, uh, they wouldn't have to necessarily put another transformer out of the street to bring in the electricity. So it's a reasonable, and I think that word reasonable is actually in the uh, state statute, but it's a reasonable expectation that an EV owner can have, by statute, an EV charging station at their dedicated um, parking space. The issue comes with where do you draw the line where that individual pays for the charging station at his uh, location, and where does the condominium need to increase their capability to provide the electricity? So there's, the, and that again gets back to the reasonableness. So most condominiums have looked at this and said, we're gonna pay for the, the larger investment so that the building and the parking areas have the capability to provide the electricity needed for those um, electric vehicles down the road. But that last, home run, what we're gonna call it, right? The last uh, dedicated line to that charging station at that person's uh, parking space, that is on the owner. So that's typically how it's done. And again, there's a common area and then the individual. This is just showing that, that it's okay, you're doing great. Uh, this is just showing that the green shows that about 40%, 50% of the uh, condominiums are, they have the charging infrastructure behind a gate. So the public can't just come in and and start charging. So uh, the blue is talking about common areas. Again, 25, 30% are within the common areas. And then the, the gold there is showing that about 40% are within the units themselves, the individual units. And one more. Okay, so this is what I thought that was very interesting on the survey. Uh, what is your method for payment for electric vehicle charging? So there's, there's five different categories here. The vehicle, the top green, vehicle owner pays the association per charge for every single charge that they, they click in. Uh, owner pays the association a flat fee per month or per year. I like that one, that's good. Uh, and then the third one is um, a third party. So it's like the charge point units and that's the modem that's going out and getting the billing information and all of that. But, and then the um, blue is uh, the vehicle owner pays nothing it's considered an, an association amenity. That's 15%. And then something else. So there's, there's other ways to do it with a decal or uh, at an annual usage basis. The two main ways, again, are with the modem and have the EV driver have to swipe a credit card and do the billing, or a flat fee. The flat fee is nice because you can look at all of the, uh, the usage. You can actually put um, meters on the electricity um, that's being used, and, and you can determine how much electricity is being used, how much that costs, and then assess that to any EV owner. So if someone's an EV owner and they live in that condo, 30 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, whatever that ends up being. And that's in the control of the HOA, rather than having to deal with rates of FPL or anything else. So I just think that's a good way to do it. 
Lots of words, lots of, uh, we're going to just have two slides, one talking about a personal charging station, that's at the individual parking spa space, I've kind of gone through all this. I do the end product. I have a charger that's commercial grade, they're at the airport, they're down at 88 Boulevard, the Arts has a couple, um, I put six down in Venice, so I, I do the end product. Um, you need an electrician to do the rest, I'm not an electrician, okay, we have to have an electrician come in. And, and do the uh, the installation of the lines and everything come to the to the charger. Central panel needed for the um, to handle a reasonable number of charging stations. Again, we don't know we could design it for build out every single one of the parking spaces that you have for an electric vehicle, but that may be too much up front. That might be too much capital up front for the for the condominium, in my opinion. So you have to kind of think through a phased approach on where you want to put these. How many per floor might be a good way to look at it as the electric vehicles start taking off. And then a common charging station, again, uh, how many do you want to support? These are typically the owners themselves will move their car when they're done. Um, there are ways to uh, incentivize people to move their vehicles, like having fees assessed if their car is still there when it's fully charged. Um, but typically EV owners will get off the charger so that another one, another person can, can get charging. All right. So this is essentially the state statutes, and again, um, the installation has to be allowed, first of all, it has to be allowed. An EV owner has to have the capability by statute now to put in the chargers. Um, and that responsibility, the owner of unit number two, uh, can be responsible for the cost of installation, operation, the additional insurance, maintenance, repair, and all those things. So many condominium associations, uh, because you don't want different brands, different flavors of charging infrastructure at each individual unit, um, standardizing on a, on a typical brand or a, a charging unit itself might be a better way to uh, take that approach. Certificates of insurance and licensed electricians and all that kind of thing is important as well. So I think that's it. I, so I know we talked a little bit, and, and then we'll ask a couple questions. But a couple things that came to my mind was first cost. You know, I was surprised how affordable these things are. Maybe you want to tell us the cost of each the one or two or whatever those levels are. Sure. Um, why don't you back up that slide real quick here? Sure. Um, we want the pictures at the bottom. So the ones with the the modems in them. Uh, they were around town for a long time. I think the county got them on a, on a grant, ARRA money, uh, years ago, uh, and they put them all downtown. And they took a credit card swipe. These units were like six grand. There's like six thousand dollars a pop. I mean, they they were expensive. Um, and then you have to pay a two hundred dollar a year per plug fee for the modem for the communications, the telecommunications. So you've got an upfront cost of the 6,000 bucks for the charger, and then you've got a $200 a year cost that goes along with that, reoccurring every single year. If they go up, it goes up with the communications. The other units, non-network units, uh, the units we have at the airport, downtown, Bank, uh, Boulevard of the Arts, uh, they're non-networked. Uh, they're 12 to 1,400 bucks a pop, okay? They don't have the ability to take a credit card swipe, but they're behind a gate in some instances. It, it, obviously, the public can't get behind that gate and, and charge. Um, the EV owners are registered with that condominium. I'm, a, I'm an EV owner. I want access to the uh, to the charger. Maybe there's a sticker on the windshield or something that says I've paid my 2022 uh, EV um, fee in order to use the charger. That, that, that's the better way to do it. Less capital, right? Cheaper up front and no long-term reoccurring um, operating costs for that telecommunications. And what do you see in more common? I mean, I know that in some of my associations, there are unit specific they have them, they're set up there. Do you have, I mean, are you seeing a lot more where they're having the unit owners and the associations purchasing some for the common people, for guests and for common use as well? Or what are you seeing? Great question. Thank you. Good to have one with all the different, uh, you, you were right, I should have done the same. What is your method of payment for EV charging? There's five different categories there uh, to each their own. A a every condo is doing it differently. And, and really, I like that because it, it, you guys might have a different situation. You might have some common area parking that you think it would be a good idea to put a, a, a charger app that uh, anybody can come in and use, including guests and visitors. 
you may not have those parking spaces available, and because of that, you'd want to have them in the individual. So it really depends on the HIV. Well, I'll open up for questions, and, and while I'm taking somebody's questions, the insurance side is not an issue. Um, so, I mean, even if there is a charge, it's very small, but most carriers won't charge because you got electric coming to the building. It's the new norm. When it first came out, I thought it was going to be an issue, to be honest with you. Um, it's the unknown. Does anybody have any, a couple questions real quick? Yep. Given FPL rates, what do you think is a reasonable monthly charge for a personal for a personal parking? So there's there's one other factor that he asked. Uh, what's the rate? What would you charge? What's reasonable? It depends on how far your people are driving. If your people are only driving a couple 10, 20 miles a day, uh, it might be as low as 10 bucks a month because it's all based on the, the miles you drive. So so um, that might be something that your HOA would want to do is a poll. How far are you going? Or you could put a, a meter on the electricity to determine how much electricity is being used for those electric vehicles. So there's no sort of average. You don't, you don't have in mind an average. Thing. No. When people ask me how much does it cost you at your house to uh, drive an electric car, I tell them a buck a night. About 30 bucks a month is what I, what I tell them. Uh, and again, that's just, again, I've been driving for 10 years, so that's kind of my go-to number. Um, is that the right number for your condominium? I don't know, because I don't know how far your folks go, and, and really that's what needs to be looked at if you're going to do it a flat fee. Typically, though, you have, a, you have a broad range, right? If you have 150 units. Right, right, and you're going to have a range of, of, right. a range of ranges of cars that drive different distances. Chris, if I can comment on that. We have three Teslas in our company. I drive approximately 250 to 300 miles a day, and it adds about $55 a month on my electric bill. I've been doing that for the last three years, so pretty consistent, and that gives you a good number. That's a heavy, that's a heavy use. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, pretty it's a heavy use. Yes, sir. Point, point three right there says it must be separately metered and payable by the owner. But yet you have a, a push for fixed fee. How does that square? Either way, uh, you, you can do that with the, the fixed, um, have it metered. You can have it metered individually. Uh, we actually do have a meter on the chargers that we've installed at 888 uh, so that we know how much those chargers are using. And that way they can check. So it's a, it's a $300 little flow, uh, I call it a flow meter. Um, electricity meter, I'm a water engineer during the day. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an electricity, you know, it, it's just a meter that tells you how much. Okay, well we'll come back, thank you. We'll get some more questions. I just wanna make sure we get all the panelists uh, thank enough you. time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up, we have Dee Smith. Obviously things are changing on her side as well. Dee, if you wanna give us some of the insights of what's going on in your world. Good afternoon, everybody. Pardon the delay. Um, well, we got a lot of new things. I actually brought some toys with me that um, whenever y'all want to come over and visit me and look at some of the new, new technology we have. We have, um, my goodness, we have electronic rat traps. We have electronic monitors that tell us anywhere in the world if, we, if we've got a catch in a live trap. We're actually having a meeting tomorrow with Rod, um, Chris, uh, Rod Smith with Bell Laboratories because I know one of the biggest things right now has been the, um, I've been reading about it and getting emails from y'all about the rodenticides killing non-targets that, that people are using. So we're actually working, we're, they're coming tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about that. We do have a product that, you know, it's even more safe than what we are already using presently. Um, it's just every day. I mean, I just got back from Nashville Friday night and just some of the stuff that's out there is just, Blows you away. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Sorry. Yeah, I guess maybe people's thoughts would be what would be, I mean, some of the major changes that you're seeing that would affect condominium associations from the pesticides to, you know, the monthly upkeep and, and anything of that sort that they would need to know today? Well, one of the things we're doing is, you know, we all, every program is built individually, well, it should be built for each individual condominium association. You should be using different devices. I mean, everybody uses rodent bait stations to keep rats out of their condos. You're using um, 
uh, insect light traps. I mean, I do nursing health care facilities. We've got ILTs, which is insect light traps, which trap, trap insects to where you can actually look at the blue board and identify what species is, is coming in because we have all kinds of new species. Um, electronic monitoring. I am not a huge fan of the ultrasonic deterrents. They still haven't really perfected them yet. Um, with uh, domestic animals, they work great. But with wild animals, they really aren't really totally perfected yet. Probably in the future they will be. Um, um, sprays, I mean, this is this particular side right here is, you know, what types of pest, you know, of pest control are harmful. Well, y'all might not believe this, but RAID, over-the-counter pesticide, kills more individuals on an annual basis than regular pesticides that we use in the industry. I personally am deathly allergic to propiopatoxinide and the ingredients in them kind of chemicals. However, I've been doing this 35 years and I guess I've survived it. Um, the chemicals are all specifically compounded for each insect. People don't realize ants have DNA and they do, they're doing DNA on, on insects and pests now that are so cool that it's just like, I know you all laugh because I'm such a nerd when it comes to bugs, but to do DNA on an insect and literally know how they, how they tick is really incredible. And I mean, that's what they're doing. And to see we're able to manufacture chemicals that are safe for us, safe for everybody else, yet they take care of that particular insect. It's, I find it interesting. Um, we have um, dangerous things. I mean, diazinon. I mean, we all, any of us that are over the age of 50 know about diazinon, Dersban, DDT, Chlorodane. I mean, then we're all go to, you know, we used to use malathion, is still available. Y'all might not believe this, malathion is actually safer than seven dust. And a lot of us use seven dust on our crops. Um, we use, um, well, you're saying dangerous chemicals, um, imidacloprid, actually, imidacloprid is not really a bad, we have to have some chemicals. We all use the same chemicals, we all purchase the same chemicals in the industry, it's just how it's used. And at Nature's Own, we use IPM methods, um, which is, I'll get around to that here in a second, but then you use granular products, I mean, there are granular products out there that literally are essential oils soaked in ground up corn cobs. You spread them all around the building. It's clove, thyme, and wintergreen. And it literally, when the water hits it, it releases this essential oils into the ground and it's one of the best pesticides there is. So it smells good around the outside of your building and you also have good pest control. And it's, you know, it's, and, it, and it works. You just have to, you know, use, so everybody thinks that natural stuff doesn't work. It does work. And y'all, Nature's Own was the first green pest control company in Sarasota 34 years ago. Foggers, I'm not a fan of them because they put pesticide all over everything you own. I mean, some people like foggers. They say, oh, listen, if you want to fog your attic, but basically a lot of things. What we do in the industry is we use dusts. We'll use either uh, boring D dust or we'll use Cymaxa, which is pharmaceutical grade silica gel. It actually, it's actually, we found it to be very effective for termites and bed bugs. And it also desiccates the, the insects that come in contact with it. So there's, you know, good things that, you know, that are available that you don't have to use the over-the-counter grade fogger. Or, and I'm not putting them down, you know, they sell millions of dollars of them a year. I just personally can't be subjected to them, and I'm sure a lot of people that I know and some people we've lost in the past couple of years uh, have been attested to that. One of the things that I work with with a lot of the plumbers, and I'm with Darren, and, and a lot of the people, and insurance people, inspectors, is a real good inspector with pest control. If you're doing your job and you're doing thorough inspection, we don't look for just everything. I'm looking under sinks, I'm looking for intrusion areas, I'm looking for rodent droppings, I'm looking for roach droppings, I'm looking for anything I can find to make sure that you don't have these critters. And what they'll do in a, in a high rise, they'll literally go right up a, a, a chase, an electric chase, a water line chase, where they, wherever you've got chases, and they will literally gain, gain entry into your property. And 
Um, Matt and them, and, and Darren will tell you too, if, if you've got a, a broken stack in one of your buildings, and I can tell you right now, all of a sudden you start getting a complaint of a bunch of, y'all call them palmetto bugs, but they're American cockroaches, you start getting a, a lot of them in a unit, what we do is we A, we have monitors, they're little blue boards, they work 24 seven for us. If we got a bunch of adult roaches coming this direction, I'm gonna go 30 feet in this direction, but and I'm gonna find that nest. And nine times out of 10, and your mids and highs, it's from a bad pipe. And if you start getting rats inside a unit, same thing. I mean, this just happened recently in one of my condos down, downtown, and sure enough, the old bug lady was right. And, and people don't wanna spend the money, but I'm telling you, your best friend is have your plumber do a visual camera, smoke your, you know, smoke your pipes, because I'm telling you, they will find the deficiencies in it, and it's not that expensive. I have a new toy that I'm just so excited about that I can literally go into a void and I can shine this, and actually it's a, what do they call it? I guess it's the little light they do colonoscopies with. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't know what the name of it is. Y'all know I don't have a filter. But you literally can drill a little hole and go into a void instead of having to go and tear open a wall. I can use this little camera and see it. It's, on, it's four foot long. I mean, it's, it's, they designed it for finding bed bugs, but I've found other uses for it. We find mold, rotting timber. I've called Darren many a time. I've said, Darren, I'm in this roof right now, and they've got so much mold up here in black, you know, it's just falling apart. Y'all need to come out. And then they've called me on in the same thing because they're like, Dee, we've got rats out in the yang here, you know, and I'm like, okay, so we all work together in this industry. God bless you. Um, one of the things that everybody has to do, I mean, these are all, I always ask for if anybody's got plans, if y'all got any plans of your, of your property, I mean, I ended up with somebody's irrigation plan that was 25 years old and they didn't even have one. And they're like, where'd you get that? I said, I don't know, it was given to me by a maintenance guy 10 years ago. Anyway, these things are great, are helpful because I can go to your building if, I've, if you've got a crawl space or if you've got an area that needs inspect, inspecting. I mean, I can find things and I can go under buildings and I can literally find your deficiencies and report it to you. When we send you a report and we say, hey, Mr. Jones, you've got, you know, a crack over here that you really need to look at, that's, I don't know, I'm not an attorney, so I don't know what the legalities of that is, but I will say that if I make a suggestion to you and I tell you it is my opinion that you check this out and you do some investigating, you really should listen to me. Because first off, I've been doing it a long time, second off, I actually helped a community downtown Sarasota years ago whenever they were just being turned over that their main fire line was literally cracking. And thank goodness I'm diligent enough and, and there are pest control companies that are diligent enough to do this. This is what you want. You want to partner up with somebody that cares, not somebody that's just getting a paycheck. Okay. Um, thank you, Dee. I appreciate that. Is there any questions for Dee? Um, the best? No, she did such a good job. Thank you, Dee. We appreciate you. <laughs> Next up to the stage is Mr. Darren Caldwell from Right Way. Thank you. I'm not going to bore you and start off with a bunch of statutes, but since we're talking new technology, 718 111, uh, subparagraph 12 talks about you as an association and the records that you must maintain. And since it's new technologies, there's some really neat ways to start maintaining them. In the old days, if I went to a board and I said, hey, where's your records? Whether it be blueprints, whether it be uh, your insurance. Normally it's in an office, right? It's probably with your property manager, or maybe it's there in your facility. Um, occasionally, I think years ago, oh, the board president has it. And then what would happen is board presidents changed, paperwork didn't come back. So people figured out that was a bad idea. Plus the board presidents got tired of people knocking on the door wanting to see the records, right? So if it's in your building and there's a major fire and you don't have a backup, where are your records? So for many years now, yes, you could actually put them on a flash. Now you can put them in a cloud, that's great. So you have those records. But for the new technology that we have that's really neat 
prior to any loss happening, whether it be water, whether it be fire, whether it be a hurricane, is Matterport 3D. I have this here. This is actually an association that we take care of in the Naples area. This is their clubhouse. With this technology, we go in, we were talking about the charging stations being 16,000, the expensive ones. I think that's funny because our cameras are $16,000 a piece that do this. It is coming down where you, you actually can wear headsets of doing it, but the ones we use, we want the great detail in. You might have seen this before with real estate companies. They use a version. With this, we can actually go in, I can measure through the square foot, the whole building uh, in 15 minutes and have your blueprints. If you have some kind of a loss and you do not have records, we can say, hey, what room was that in? I can go ahead of time and do, I can walk through this whole building and do a complete inventory for you of everything in here. If you call and said, hey, Darren, we had a loss in our gymnasium. There was a fire. We can go through, we had a large fire um, that happened at a business. All his business records got burned up. He figured he had about $40,000 worth of equipment. By the time he walked through, because we did it after the loss and added everything up, he came up with $34,000 worth of equipment he could prove. The other thing it helps us, if there was a loss in this facility, and you called and said, Darren, I have sewer water, cat three, it's all in the gym. It helps us because we can look and see, hey, how much of this, what's the floor? How much if there's furniture in there? How many like these chairs here? These are metal, metal legs. If sewer water hits these, I can still save them. If they were textiles all the way down to the ground, I'm gonna throw them away. Well, why does that matter? Time is money during a loss. So with this technology, not only can we document prior to a loss, it helps us during the loss, because as we're headed there, we can say, hey, bigger dumpster, lots of textiles, we're throwing stuff away or bigger contents trailers, because a lot of this material we can save and we want to bring it back to our contents division. We can clean mold, we can clean biohazards, we can take care of fire smoke damage. So this te technology is really great. It's part of a, a program that we do. We have it stored and you have it stored. Also as board members, if you're anywhere in the world and there was a loss in your association, and you're the last board member who hasn't gotten to see it. You're out of state right now. We send you this link and we say, hey, come into this room with us here. You had a water loss over by the sliders and let me show it to you. Anywhere in the world, if you have internet connection, we can send this, you get on your computer, get on your iPhone and you can see it. So it's really great new technology that's really helping boards. Uh, well, I, I can tell you for first hand, I use this with some of my clients, it's amazing. And I don't know the number, but I can tell you during the loss, the average person forgets, I want to say it's something like 40%. So you cheat yourself. Now obviously on the association, you have the appraisal for the exterior, but the interior for the units and so forth, this is a great tool to make sure, because I can tell you what, during the loss, you have something like this, the adjuster's not going to think twice. Boom, here's a check. Makes it really easy. And technology, and I told you earlier, I'm technology challenged. Um, so we don't have to do anything with this. I know that their company, we work with them a lot. Uh, they come in, put it together, um, and free. Everyone likes the word free. <laughs> free of charge. So this is a great way to protect your association. If you aren't involved in this program, um, I think it's a great idea to at least talk to Darren about how to set it up. Maybe you can talk about how that works. And Absolutely. I'll give you some, some guidance on this. So Mike's talking about this is part of our emergency response program. And the other technology that we have is droning. And I know when I say droning, a lot of people say, hey, we don't want drones flying around. Well, neither do we, except for our licensed drone pilot. I work for an owner who's really into technology. That's why we have the Tesla. That's why we have a full-time drone pilot. We have three really cool drones. And then we actually have a full-time Matterport team that does this. So that is all part of the ERP program where we'll drone your roof line ahead of time. So if you have a claim, something happens and they say, hey, that roof wasn't maintained, every 12 months you're getting drone photos at no charge. 
It helps with insurance. They want to know, hey, Mike, what's the condition of this association? If you have drone pictures showing the associations in good shape, you have a Matterport of your common areas showing you're up to date, everything's great. Um, it really helps with actually when they go out to bid, it helps us as emergency contractors. If you called and said, and whether you're a tower, uh, you might be just multi-story units. If you said, hey, buildings two and three, the roofs are half ripped off. As the team's going, we're pulling up our drone pictures. What's that roof line look like? Is it tarpable? Do they have large flat areas? We take care of the Ringling Museum, parts of that. There's parts of those vaults that have just flat ceilings. You can't tarp a flat ceiling because it becomes a very heavy pool that will eventually collapse. So do we need to build uh, temporary structures in order to tarp it? By doing this ahead of time and using the technology, the results are always better for you. I will caution this with emergency response programs. Um, right away, we happen to be the largest in the county, Sarasota, not saying largest is always best, but I will say make sure you have a local company and make sure whether it be your manager or your attorney looks at some of the new programs out there. Uh, there's a new property management company in town that came from out of state, and they're submitting this emergency response programs. Um, you need to use our company to do this. They're not here local. Um, and once you sign that contract, no matter what happens, they're controlling your construction. And if you decide we don't like the way you're doing it, there's actually an embedded fee schedule where you're paying a lot of money for it. So I'm just bringing that up because if I'm gonna be very emergency response planning, telling you, hey, it's a great thing to do, make sure that you look at a contract. For instance, our contract is not a contract. It's an agreement that says we're gonna do all this for you, there's no charge, and at any time, if you don't like our services, then tell us to leave and we will. We have to earn our right to be on your property every day. So use the technology. I don't know if anyone else is doing the Matterport and droning. There are companies that are doing what's called ERP, the emergency response plans, but a lot of them too, if you look, it's cookie cutter. And everyone in this room has a different kind of association. If you're downtown towers and I take care of some of them, how I'm parking, the heavy equipment I have to bring in, the lifts we have to bring in is totally different than possibly a cluster of 40 villas. It looks totally different. But that 40 villas may be full of 100-year-old oak trees. So I need to know ahead of time, if I'm gonna to respond to you, what's the roads gonna look like? Do I need to have, we'll take a bulldozer. We don't actually get rid of your debris, but we do push it out of the way. So if you want, we need to get to your building to fix things, we'll push it off. Uh, your landscaper is the one that would actually pick it up after we remove it. So the technologies are there not only for pre-disaster planning, during, and it's also the same system I showed you for this, we do during a loss. Why is that important? Mike can tell you in the insurance world, documentation is everything. Fast forward three years, let's say you have a, a, a unit owner, they have a mold issue, they tell the board, the board says yes, our roof was leaking, and now you fix it. Three years later, something in that unit, that unit owner leaves a window open, it gets wet, now they have a mold issue. The unit owner says, you as a board, they had an issue here three years ago, you never fixed it. Yes we did, where's your documentation? You have a flat sheet of paper, that says, oh, we were here, we fixed it. What about if I could go in in 3D, because we do this on every loss over $2,000, we document the loss. So you're gonna see the drywall cut away. You're gonna see all the interior structures that are treated, if it was mold, if it was fire, and you as a board, has you have those records forever. So they say pictures worth a thousand words. This, when I can actually walk up and touch the images, this technology is amazing for you. Good. All right. Thank you. I was going to give you the hook there. Yeah. <laughs> How many people have, have this kind of a plan, a cat plan? I call it a cat plan. He calls it an ERP to kind of combine. Anybody? No one in here has that? David does. Okay. You guys should be, I mean, I'm not plugging this situation, but you should be lining up and talking to Darren afterwards. It is a great thing. And again, what I said was it was free. You know, you go out, look at it. If you don't like what he's doing, you move on to the next thing. But I think it's a great piece being in the insurance industry and having personal experience. I tell you, I'm not here to plug anybody. I had a water damage loss. I had two of them. They came out, got it done for me. I believe in people that respond and I see it every day. You know, you're gonna do business with the people you wanna do business with. Not only did he respond, 
those people over there, Aqua Plumbing, did my repipe of my entire house. So, you know, I've been a member at, of the community here. I was born and raised here. So you know the good contractors and the bad. Um, so I would urge you to take a look at a cap plan. I won't push to look at Darren's, but Darren's is free. Um, did I mention free? Yeah. Um, all right. So next up, we're moving right along. We have Lester Santos with Cadence Bank. Last but not least. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lester Santos. I'm from Cadence Bank. Been in banking for 29 years, and I'm going to talk to you about banking, lending. You know, all these technologies that we're talking about up here is fantastic, but these are not normally things that are in your reserves. So you need to kind of look outside the box and say, well, if this is something that we want, what is it that we're looking for? Meaning, how are we planning for this? How are we going to finance for this? Uh, that's the big picture. But there's two types of loans, and I'm going to stop here for a quick second because the phone calls that I get all the time looking for loans are fantastic. And that's why when folks call me or call our team, the first thing they ask is, hey, I want a line of credit. No reason. I just want a lot of credit. Why? Because I want to buy that charger, or I want to go ahead and get something done, landscaping done, or some type of improvements, but we're going to take care of it ourselves. And what I say to that is, you don't need a lot of credit. You need a term loan. You need a term loan to understand the project that you're looking for, whether it's installing anything that you're looking at, whether it is actually improving your actual building and all your common areas, is that term loan. Lines of credit are great for emergency purposes which is a, a big purpose. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, a little louder. A little louder. Man, that's surprising. I'm Spanish, and I'm usually louder than this. But uh, thank you. So the lines of credit are used for emergency purposes. And we'll look at that in case of just that, the emergency purposes. Darren, I'm going to give you a plug right now, because exactly what you're showing right now is huge for us when it comes into these lines of credit. If we have information like that, to show our underwriters the reason that you would need this line of credit for emergency purposes, again, hurricane is really the main reason we're looking at it, that would only help us out in underwriting that deal for that emergency to use line of credit. That would be fantastic. So the first time Darren showed me this, if I could show this to the underwriter, because I can't take the underwriter out of where they're at into that location, that's key. So if you do have that technology, thank you. And I, would, I think I'm allowed to use it, am I right? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So that's piece for the line of credit. Term loans. For the term loans is the ones that I will be looking for and my team will be looking for as it relates to installing the EV charging stations or to making any type of improvements into your particular um, association. And the term loan itself, we need to know several things. We need to know the description of the project. What's the project about? What is it that you're doing? We need to know that it's actually been approved by the board and that the actual finance has been approved also by the board to go ahead and get the actual piece done. I'm gonna go ahead and cheat here real quick just to make sure I don't miss, miss any of my points as well. An opinion letter. That's gonna be key because in every board, your governing documents will be different. So you need to find out if in your particular governing documents, you are able to go ahead and actually do the loan or what kind of votes are actually needed to do the loan. That's something key that we will be looking forward to to see if we can get that piece of proof as well. So for example, if right now your government documents state on there that you, know you have a required two-thirds vote, or if it's just the board can go ahead and get it done, perfect. But if the governing documents do not have that information, it becomes pretty vague. So what we will refer to is we'll request for an opinion letter so we can understand that the attorney has actually approved that particular piece of who's able to vote for that, who's able to get that approved and move that forward. Delinquencies. We look at your accounts receivable delinquencies. We need to go ahead and make sure that the assessments that are being paid are being paid on time, and also if there's any type of uh, issues, we would like to address them at that point in time. Your financials, budgets, budgets are key. I need your current year budget and your previous year budgets. The current year budget is the one that we'll go ahead and discuss. And the reason I'm saying this is because right now I need to make, to make sure that you guys are working with a bank that's association friendly. Meaning that we will go through that budget with you, we will go ahead and discuss those budgets with you, and if anything's off base, we would definitely love to discuss that before it goes into any type of underwriting. Okay? The size of the actual units, or the, or the actual condo, miners. 
So I can't really do a loan for something that only has five units. I could actually do a loan for something that has typically more than about 20 to 30 units. It's really where we start kind of looking at the particular deal. It doesn't mean that we can't do it. It'll be just a lot more difficult for us to look at. The, let me make sure I'm not missing any of my points. Total number of units. All right, so the way that we would size our loan, it'll depend on the project itself, depending on the project that they're looking at at this point in time. It'll depend on how long the project, the useful life of the project. So I'm not gonna do a 10-year loan for landscaping. It just doesn't quite work that way. But I may be looking at a 10-year loan for a roofing structure, okay, that will be there for a longer period of time. So we will work on that with every part of, oh yeah, we're not in Fannie Mae yet, Freddie Mac, sorry about that. <laughs> so um, that is the piece for the lending piece as what's required of the bank as a whole. Now, reserve studies are going to be something that we will certainly look at. Um, I would prefer that you guys have a reserve study because we, uh, just like right now with that technology you're talking about, we can add those uh, reserve studies as well and really make a great case for that. I would go ahead and veer off here just one more time because of the fact that this is something that we're seeing as we're seeing financials often as it relates to associations. Fraud. I'm going to repeat that again. Fraud. Very, very, very prevalent out there. Um, fraud's out of control. Who here has been affected by fraud in any type of financials at all? We got one, two. It's not a matter of, you know, if, but when. And I'm telling you right now because we see that all the time. From an association standpoint, there was a um, particular project we were working on. And as we were finishing the project and the lending itself, towards the end of the project, they had two payments left to go ahead and pay for them, uh, for this project, from our loan. As the payment request came in, we were working with the CAM. And as the CAM has been working with this particular contractor for the past two years, the CAM actually requested another $30,000 check to be sent in to the contractor, something that we were working with previously before with no problem. What has happened was that the CAM's email was hacked two years ago. And for two years, They've been looking at their email, what's been happening on this entire project from the beginning to end. And on the last two payments, the actual hacker got into the email, switched the email by one letter. It looked like it was coming from the same individual. And when he switched the email by that one letter, that particular email came in, the CAM approved an actual check to be sent to that contractor for $35,000. It was a dual line signature. They went ahead and sent it out without approval and to send the actual check to the hacker because they changed the actual address, part of a project that we're working on alone. I'm bringing this up because as you guys are keeping track of your records, records are going to be key. As you guys are looking at keeping track of this, please make sure that you know what's happening in and out. Please make sure you have um, systems in place, let's just say. Uh, who's going to be looking at your email? Uh, who is going to be actually looking at your online banking piece, please make sure that you're looking at your online banking piece at all times. And what happens with that, you need, uh, I would say, multi-factor um, sign-ons, and uh, just make sure that you're looking at it, because that's going to be key um, as, that, as a whole. All right, so the Freddie Mac situation. All right, so Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Kristen told me that there was a lot of interest in this. Is there a lot of interest in this right now that we're looking at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac on this one? Okay, so I'll briefly go over this real quick, <laughs> just to make sure that we're there. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, there, there's been an increase uh, from last year to this year. The highest loan that you could be looking at from Fred, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is $647,200. That's the highest loan that you can look at at this point in time. It's up $98,000 from last year. Um, the biggest difference right now that we're looking at uh, doing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is that you are going to be required to get a lot more information for them to be approved for that. And quite frankly, with what's happened down south in the Champlain Towers, that's the reason why. So they're going to go ahead and ask you more information. If there's any type of special assessments on there, they will request more information about why, what's a special assessment about. Uh, they're going to go ahead and request information about your last six board minutes. Uh, for the last six months to find out what's been going on, if there's any type of indication that if there's any 
uh, indication that there was something wrong previously before, and if there has been, then they'll probably kind of make you ineligible for uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Uh, they will be asking for uh, special ass assessment information to find out why there is any special assessments and what happened with those. The application process got much longer as well. It's about nine pages now, but that's information that the record keepings from the actual property management company uh, and or the association needs to be key. So, any questions on that, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae? Awesome. That's what I have. Okay. Well, we appreciate it. I have a couple questions and then we'll open it up and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, obviously, there's two things in my world that I'm seeing and one is more prevalent now than ever. Insurance costs are rising through the roof. So people are getting hit. Unfortunately, some of them are two, three hundred percent increases and they're needing to get the money. Obviously, the insurance agencies and so forth have a premium finance available. Now, if I have a relationship with a bank and I need to get funds, is that something that you're competitive with? Is it easy to do? How, how do they go about doing something like that? So, yes to both. It is competitive and it's easy to do. So, if we were going to get the same information we talked about before, we can go ahead and set up a product that, in essence, we can renew it every single year for the actual premiums that you're talking about, typically with a maturity of about 11 months. So, we can go ahead and renew it every single year, but it's something we do very often. Okay. Any other questions here uh, regarding the banking side of things? Anyone? Um, okay, then I want to, yes. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> How do rentals affect loans? You didn't Good mention that at all. And some buildings don't have any rental restrictions. I'm just curious, at what percentage is it bad for a building to allow rental? Yeah, no, good question. So the rental is something that we certainly do ask as far as the owner occupied and who's in there and who's not. So typically on that one, anything above 30%, we start actually asking a lot of questions. So 30% is really our magic number. Uh, it's not a set in stone, but that's the one that's gonna say, okay, what are we looking at right there? Then we ask, also ask how many people own those rentals? Is it just one person owning those 30% or one entity owning that? And if that's the case, then we would certainly go ahead and drive it deeper into those numbers as well. Does that answer your question? Yes, Okay, sure. Any other questions in banking or in general? I know I shut down uh, Darren without any questions. I apologize for that. <laughs> Um, any questions in general for the, the, the entire panel? We appreciate them being here, obviously. Now the time, any questions? No questions, no questions? No? Okay, Kristen, I guess. There she is, she will come up. Well, I'd like to thank the panelists myself, uh, because uh, I know this isn't my specialty, so my moderating skills were maybe a little bit off, so thank you very much. Thank you.